1995, New Jersey Six Flags Great Adventure opened Viper, a one-of-a-kind prototype coaster by Japanese manufacturer Togo. While it seemed like a mesmerizing thrill ride on the surface, it would go down in infamy as one of the park's worst attractions, and in less than a decade, it would cease operation. But why exactly did Viper suffer the fate of McDonald's onion nuggets? It's time to go back to the past and find out. Now let's go back to the mid-1980s, when Japanese manufacturer Togo was at the height of their popularity. After several successful coaster installations in their home country, the company would enter the North American coaster market in 1984. That year would see the debut of King Cobra at Ohio's Kings Island. This would be the first ground-up stand-up coaster in the United States, and it would pave the way for more Togo installations. One year later in 1985, the company would introduce another stand-up coaster to North America, this time at Canada's Wonderland. With two successful installations on their resume, Togo's international prospects looked rosy. Meanwhile, in their home country, the company would introduce a brand new coaster model that would take the amusement industry by storm. This coaster was the Ultra Twister. First set to have opened at Tokyo Dome City in 1985, the Ultra Twister would consist of an extremely compact layout with no turns. Instead, a switch track would send riders backwards after they reached the end of one side. Moreover, the layout would also feature several groundbreaking inversions known as Heartline Rolls. As the name implied, a Heartline Roll would rotate guests in a barrel roll, with their chest serving as the center of rotation. Even today, the Heartline Roll remains one of the most popular inversions on the market, and if it wasn't for Togo, we may not have the Skyrocket 2. In addition to this upside-down innovation, the model is most remembered for its unique track design, where rails on the side of the vehicles would be supported with tubular support rings. The result was a hypnotic, dreamlike, and visually satisfying ride experience that still remains on many coaster enthusiasts' bucket lists. For the mid-80s, this coaster design was way ahead of its time, and it wouldn't be long before it entered the American market. In 1986, Six Flags Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey would install their own Ultra Twister model named, well, Ultra Twister. Upon its opening, the coaster's unique ride experience would be an instant success and was widely praised by the public. It went over the edge and was straight down, it was like nothing was around you. And just kept turning around, it was so crazy. I was just screaming, I was, oh, it was so scary. Dude, it was awesome. Started going real slow, got to the top, dropped down. Then we started spinning, I was scared out of my wits, man. Got the top, went back the same way, it was awesome. Number one ride in the park! Number one! Number one! You'll never get a better one! Despite its popularity though, the ride faced many issues. First of all, the vertical lift hill proved to be difficult to evacuate guests on during a ride stoppage. Moreover, its unique track design was subject to stress fractures, and it would often require re-welding. And as if that weren't bad enough, the ride's capacity was limited to around 1,080 riders per hour. By comparison, Nitro's capacity is around 1,800 guests per hour. But by far the worst thing about Ultra Twister was its technical issues. It was said to be extremely unreliable, and it only operated sporadically inside the park. All of these issues combined reportedly led to the decision to close the coaster after just three seasons of operation. The ride would be dismantled in 1989, and it would eventually reopen one year later at Texas's Six Flags Astroworld with significant modifications. Meanwhile, the ride's former spot in New Jersey would remain vacant, with only its footers and a single white shed left over. For around half a decade, Six Flags would attempt to fill Ultra Twister's spot. At one point, the now-defunct Swiss Bob ride was set to be relocated there after being replaced with the Batman Stun Arena. At another point, Park officials wanted to move one of the Lightning Loops tracks into that spot and have it run next to Rolling Thunder. However, neither of those plans would come into fruition. As the mid-90s approached, it seemed like the park would never fill the spot. After all, what attraction could possibly be compact enough to fit in such a small plot of land? Meanwhile, across the globe, Togo was looking to better serve their clients in North America. So in 1991, the company opened up a subsidiary in Middletown, Ohio. The state would now be home to not only Togo's American offices, but a new testing facility as well. And it was at this facility that Six Flags would discover their next major attraction. In 1994, Six Flags officials took a visit to Togo's Ohio testing facility. On the grounds was a new prototype attraction known as a Mega Coaster. This coaster took elements from the company's standard sit-down and ultra-twister models and combined them together into one ride. 
Certain sections of the track would feature the same structural rings as the Ultra Twister, in addition to the same Heartline inversion. Unlike the Ultra Twister though, this ride would have turns, and feature an uninterrupted full circuit layout. The wheels would also be underneath the vehicles instead of on the sides. The test model would also feature a new one-of-a-kind inversion known as a dive loop, but this wasn't like the typical dive loop that twists riders into a drop. This dive loop consisted of an elongated vertical loop with an inline twist on top. Upon seeing the test model in action, Six Flags officials immediately fell in love with the concept. A new attraction like this would be the perfect successor to the Ultra Twister, and its compact design would easily fit in the ride's spot. These factors, combined with the long-standing desire to fill Ultra Twister's spot, led Six Flags to purchase the prototype straight off the testing grounds. And with that, the ride's development was officially underway. With a new coaster in the pipeline, park officials were tasked with coming up with the ride's theme. After the Time Warner Corporation purchased Six Flags in 1992, executives wanted the chain's parks to add more themed elements to areas which lack them. With its bland fencing and concrete, Ultra Twister's space was in desperate need of a theming update. It was therefore decided to combine the park's Best of the West and Hernando's Hideaway sections into a brand new western-themed area named Frontier Adventures. The new coaster would serve as an A-list attraction in this area, and officials aimed on giving it a strong western theme. During development, the ride was originally set to be named and themed to the award-winning Clint Eastwood Western, Unforgiven. However, the park's market research showed that such a dark, bloody, and violent R-rated movie was not suitable for theming a roller coaster after. Instead, Six Flags went with a more run-of-the-mill western theme and would end up naming the ride Viper. Unoriginal name aside, Six Flags planned on heavily theming Viper, so much so that park officials requested more rings to be added to the ride's layout. This was done in order to give it a more snake-like appearance, which would perfectly fit the ride's name. In addition, an elaborate queue experience was planned, with western-style buildings lining the pathway. It was clear that Six Flags didn't just want a thrill ride, they wanted an immersive, themed experience as well. This was a definite contrast to the larger, but less themed attractions they would install in the early to mid-2000s. By November 1994, land prep would officially begin, with construction crews clearing out the spot of the old Ultra Twister. Meanwhile, Togo would begin the manufacturing process, putting together the ride's components and unique structure. Construction would continue through the rest of 1994 and the early months of 1995, with the coaster scheduled to open that spring. Unlike other prototype coaster models, construction would be both swift and right on schedule. And after months of supports and theming being erected, Viper would officially open to the public on June 2, 1995. At the ride's entrance, guests would be greeted by an impressive sign featuring a giant detailed snakehead. After passing underneath said sign, guests would enter the elaborate queue with plenty of western theming. This large queue area would provide shade under the building's awnings, which was especially helpful in the hot New Jersey sun. There would even be a large decorative area with decorations like a covered wagon and even real cactus plants. This area would later be the site of a show called The Legend of Venom Gulch, which would entertain guests waiting in line and passing by. It was truly one of the most elaborately themed Six Flags queues of all time. Finally, the ride's elaborate station would be modeled after an old Spanish mission, complete with a mock bell. But what about the coaster itself? Would it live up to the promises of its queue? Guests on opening day were about to find out. The ride experience went as followed. Guests would start by taking a left turn out of the station towards the lift hill. The train would ascend 88.6 feet into the air before another left turn took them towards the first drop. After plummeting downwards, the train would immediately head upward towards the dive loop. This inversion was followed by a bank turn to the left and an Ultra Twister style Heartline roll. Finally, passengers would navigate an upwards bank turn before hitting the final brake run. After disembarking, guests could buy an on-ride photo, pick up some Viper merchandise, grab a bite from the Viper snack bar, or grab a drink from the special Viper vending machine. Despite its short length, the ride experience was heavily praised on opening day. Coaster enthusiast Carol Zajbaum said, quote, It's awesome and incredible. Coaster enthusiast Eric Search said, quote, If it gives a great punch for 40 seconds, that's all I need. And coaster enthusiast Steven Urbanowicz said, quote, It's the most fun I've ever had on a roller coaster. Indeed, Viper showed promise on its opening, but it wouldn't take long for the ride's reputation to go south, way south. As early as its opening day, the ride had issues with reliability. Sometime during the day, 
One of the air brakes failed, causing one of the trains to be stuck just outside of the station for 10 minutes. While it's not unusual for brand new rides to have issues on opening day, this minor glitch only served to foreshadow the coaster's problems. Viper would face technical issues. Much like Ultra Twister, Viper's trains would put too much stress on the track joints. As a result, the track would again require constant rewelding. According to Great Adventure History, there were at least two instances of entire sections of track being completely removed. The dive loop was speculated to be an especially problematic portion of the ride, and at one point, a ladder was added to the dive loop in order to give easy access to maintenance crews. Perhaps the most constant issue the ride faced was its restraint system. The unusual system featured both a lap bar and ratcheting shoulder pads. Oftentimes, these pads would be set too low or too high, forcing the staff to repeatedly lock and unlock the trains. Some had hoped the ride's prototypical kinks would be worked out, but things only got worse over the years. Throughout its run at the park, the coaster seemed to get rougher every year. Riders reported having their heads ricochet side to side on the shoulder restraints. Throughout the whole layout, the only smooth part was said to be the Heartline roll. To this day, Viper is widely considered not only to be the worst great adventure roller coaster, but one of the roughest, most merciless, and overall worst roller coasters of all time. As the years went on, the ride's issues only seemed to worsen. Its roughness turned off potential re-riders, and its technical issues were a persistent migraine for the park's maintenance team. Viper would constantly break down and face downtime only rivaled by Batman and Robin the Chiller. These issues would prove to be so severe that the ride was closed for the entire 2001 season. Coincidentally enough, Togo would close their American offices that year after filing for bankruptcy. In many ways, time was not kind to Viper, and even though it reopened in 2002, the ride's future was not looking so good. By the mid-2000s, the ride's paint job and popularity had faded significantly. By 2004, the once hyped up attraction felt like an afterthought, and the next year would be the final nail in the coffin. In 2005, Great Adventure would see the debut of Kenga Ka, the tallest and formerly fastest roller coaster on Earth. But at the start of the season, something was missing. Viper had not opened, and it didn't take long to figure out the ride was on the chopping block. While many thought it would be relocated to another Six Flags park, that was not the case. The way the ride was cut up into a jagged metal heap made clear that it was destined for the scrapyard. There were no last rides and no loving send-offs. The ride was simply tossed aside and quietly closed, a true testament of how unpopular and neglected it became. The story of Viper's failure is indeed a memorable one. No matter what the park did, the ride was a complete and total flop. Pretty much nobody cared when it was operating, and pretty much nobody cared when it closed for good. It was also speculated that the bankruptcy of Togo and the closing of their American offices in 2001 made getting spare parts especially challenging. And while Togo does still manufacture parts for their existing attractions, they haven't built a new roller coaster since their bankruptcy. As for what would replace Viper, park fans doubted that a new coaster would fill its spot anytime soon. After a record-breaking investment like King to Ka, many assumed Viper's spot would be filled with something small. But later that year, Six Flags surprised the skeptical with the announcement of El Toro. This Intamin prefabricated wooden coaster would stand as the tallest and fastest wooden coaster that didn't suck. Construction on the new attraction would begin immediately, with the new ride opening in 2006. While the queue area and the footers were completely removed, El Toro would reuse Viper's Spanish Mission Station. The only changes made were the ride's logo being added and the ride's exit being in a different spot in the station. While Viper was considered one of the worst coasters ever, El Toro would be universally acclaimed as one of the greatest roller coasters of all time. And since 2009, it is consistently placed among the top three wooden coasters in Amusement Today's Golden Ticket Awards. Now that's one hell of an accomplishment. But as for Viper, it will be forever remembered as one of the biggest failures in roller coaster history. Special thanks to El Toro Ryan for helping me out with this video. He's got his own channel with plenty of amazing videos. So if you want to check out his channel, I've left a link in the description. And before we wrap things up, I want to give a special shout out to my newest Patreon supporters. Verbal shout outs start at the gold tier, so if you don't hear your name, it will be listed at the end of the video. Here is a special shout out to Mikey Brother and Bloody Vicious. Thank you all so much, and if you want to support me on Patreon, I've put a link in the description. Your support will help out the channel.
Thanks for watching everyone. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or you can check out my website at themeparkcrazy.com. This is Theme Park Crazy, and I'll see you all next time. Oh my god. <laughs> outrageous. I recommend uh, outrageous. it to everyone here. Oh my, I'm shaking. Oh my god. <laughs> it was outrageous. That was the best ride. I highly recommend this ride. This is definitely It was great. Oh. It's the best ride in the park. The most fun is going dropping straight down. It's